I'd like to introduce Peter Sheldon, who is uh, VP Strategy at Magento, also uh, formerly a principal analyst at Forrester, uh, where if, uh, if you've read reports on, uh, uh, in e-commerce on B2B, B2C, digital in-store or mobile, there's a, there's a good chance that, uh, that Peter's name was on it. So uh, welcome, Peter, and, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. So as Peter said, uh, I've spent the last, uh, well, my entire career in this space, I spent five years at Forrester covering uh, yeah. e-commerce trends and what's happening in the market, uh, and although I'm not there anymore, in, in my current position at Magento, still spend a lot of time with uh, you know, our clients' uh, global install base, and I wanted to share with you just quickly this morning some of the sort of emerging uh, trends. Uh, not all of these necessarily will take off, but I think it's the perfect time of year at the start of January to sort of think about what, what might be happening this year, what are some of the investments that we, we might want to look at, the, the technologies and trends that we want to track. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. Um, the first of these is, is what we might call channel management. Um, we're seeing a significant proliferation of channels, um, you know, from social marketplaces, you know, the web, um, you know, we talk about chatbots, etc. And, and this is great, but when you're in an e-commerce world, one of the big, big challenges is managing your inventory. Um, when we think about inventory, and specifically the challenge for, for e-commerce is, one of the things that's often missed as e-commerce practitioners is you spend a lot of time obsessing about conversion rates. We spend a lot of time and money investing in our checkout processes, trying to make our conversion rates better. But one of the things that we always we often miss is that actually one of the one of the causes of um, failed conversions is the fact that the product that the customer wants to buy is out of stock. Um, you know, where there, there's an intent to buy. Um, if the product was there, if they could click the Add to Cart button, they would buy. But, but it's really the Achilles heel of the e-commerce industry that a lot of the time, the, you know, the specific SKU, especially for fashion and apparel, the size color combination that the customer wants is out of stock. And so you're, you're kind of putting up a brick wall and a, and a barrier. Um, and I'll talk in a moment a little bit about, uh, about some of the initiatives that retailers are doing to try and solve this problem. One other thing, just while I'm on this slide, I just want to sort of highlight the very first point as well. 35% of all sort of failed transactions, um, why customers abandon the car is due to shipping costs, and we'll come to that in a moment. So when we think about these, um, these sort of failed transactions, you know, one of the one of the other things is that the customer um, doesn't always want to buy online. You know, often they're using the web purely as a, a sort of research tool to enable them to go to the store and pick up products in the store. And so I think most retailers now have you know this store lookup uh, capability, the ability to, to look into the store inventory, see what's there. Um, but but a lot of these are sort of fairly basic. They just sort of say, hey, in stock, out of stock, and the customers that's not good enough. That you know they really want to have 100% confidence that if they're going to make a trip to the store, that the store has that specific style, color, size combination that they want. And so one of the great things, great examples like here, you know, they're, they're showing here um, not just that, you know, that it's in stock, but they're actually showing their supply chain data to the consumer. And this is really, really sort of changing its, you know, the thinking on its head. This is sort of taking that kind of Uber type mentality of saying, well, why, why should this be proprietary back office data? Let's put this data in the hands of the customer. So now the customer has the confidence to say, you know, well, they have, what is it, three pieces in stock today, but obviously getting a delivery the day after, then they'll have four pieces, and actually looking into their sell through rates to sort of have predictive analysis of how many they're going to have in stock. And this is sort of game changing for the customer because now, you know, I'm not just sort of, it's what they say they have it, but I don't believe them. Now I actually believe that they have it because they're giving me this data. So this is sort of like one example of how we're seeing, um, you know, back office data being sort of consumerized and put into the hands of the customer. And I talked a moment ago about, um, you know, this, this problem, sort of the Achilles heel of e-commerce, the products are out of stock. And what we're seeing more and more is uh, the use of, um, order management platforms. Magento has an order management platform. There's many um, solutions out there in the marketplace that hook into all your sources of inventory, whether they're your suppliers, drop shippers, your, where, your, your, your web warehouses, your physical stores, your, your, your other distribution centers. And so it, instead of the, the traditional way of working that the web looks into the web distribution center and says, do we have it for the web channel? 
So that, that's yesterday's sort of mentality. Today, we have to look across the entire source of inventory, regardless of channel, regardless of, of, of all the different suppliers we work with, to say, do we have this product somewhere? I don't really care where, but can we leverage, this, for example, the store inventory so that we can promise this to the customer and sh make it available to them on the web? And this is a really sort of, um, you know, this sort of... Uh, um, ship from from store mentality. You know, we've seen a big adoption of this in the U.S. I think we're a little bit further behind in Canada, um, but but it's really really taking off. And so it, it's sort of invigorating or changing the role of the store, and that they're there to support the web as well as obviously being a very valuable uh, channel in their own right. And then one other interesting trend um, is, you know, we believe that every experience will ultimately become digitally transactional. And I think there's no better example of this than Amazon Go. Is everyone familiar with Amazon Go and what this is? Yeah, so, you know, th this is this new sort of grocery concept that they have um, where they're going to know the second you pick something off the shelf that you that you picked it up and put it in your basket. And they're not using RFIDs or, or tags or anything like that. They're using highly sophisticated real-time video monitoring to actually sort of do facial recognition and product recognition and know that you pick something up and put it in. It, it, it's very, very game-changing technology. But the point about this is that the transaction changes from sort of being sort of at the end of the process to literally every movement that you make is recording a transaction. And, and we're going to see more of these types of things happening, um, you know, the IoT, Internet of Things, you know, really changing business models. You know, even the way we buy clothing may change in the future, where I don't buy a garment, I pay for that garment based on how often I use it, how many times I wear it, and I effectively pay a subscription for the garment. So, so you know, it might sound a little far-fetched and out there, but that's exactly the kind of uh, um, disruption that we're seeing. It's going to have a big, big impact on e-commerce, because, you know, we're not necessarily going to be sort of buying perpetual um, uh, goods that we pay a one-time fee for. We're going to be moving into this subscription economy and microtransactions where we pay for things as we use them. So that's our first trend. Now, second, um, really big one, and, and I think you know, having a big impact here in Canada is um, you know the, the change in paradigm of consumer expectations for delivery. Um, really predictable, fast, and free is the new normal. Um, really interesting study here on the, on the left of the screen from Deloitte that came out just recently, asking U.S. consumers what they consider fast shipping to be, and you can see here, you know, the vast majority of consumers now expect fast shipping to be within to be within two days. And this is exactly the disruption that we've seen here in the US that we're now seeing here um, in, in Canada with uh, the, the, the free um, you know, prime membership providing two-day shipping and now here in Vancouver, Toronto, certain items being available same-day shipping. And this is really, really game-changing for the consumer because it set, resets expectations. Um, and it resets expectations for all the other brands and retailers selling online that, that hey, if, you know, that this sort of traditional paradigm of Canada of it taking four or five business days to get my goods, that doesn't cut it anymore. I'm going to shop. I'm going to shop at Amazon because I can guarantee that I get everything within two days. The other sort of interesting thing that's happening, I talked a moment ago about ship from store. The other thing that's sort of, you know, really taken off um, is, is buy online, pick up in store. There's a lot of debate about you know, what's the real business case, why do, why do retailers invest in buy online, pick up in store? And the number one reason is that it's, it's exactly this, this sort of Achilles heel problem that I showed earlier. 35% of online transactions are abandoned because the shipping costs were too high. And shipping costs in Canada are exceptionally high compared to, you know, other markets like the U.S. UK and the US. Um, and so, you know, the, the, one of the really attractive things I think in this market is this ability to do uh, buy online, pick up and store. And yes, it's more convenient. Um, you, you, know, you, you know, yes, I may want to go to the store anyway, but the primary reason is that I avoid those shipping costs, and, and you know, which can be very, very significant. So we're seeing a lot of investment um, by uh, continued investment in sort of evolving these buy online, pick up and store um, programs and, and sort of integrating all this together because there's subtle differences between uh, um, having an inventory selector where I can see what the store has versus then actually you know reserving something versus having it shipped to me from the store. Another thing that's happening, not so much yet in Canada, but uh, is Canada both doing some good innovations here, but we see again looking into other international markets like the UK here, significant investment around the control that the consumer has on how they actually receive their purchase. So I've done my purchase, I may have got free shipping, it's guaranteed it's going to come in two days, but how is it going to come, when and where, and being able to control this. So in the UK, um, DPD is one of the sort of big uh, delivery courier networks, and they've got this great app 
back, and there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do in here. You can select a specific time slot of when it's going to come. You can, um, you know, configure sort of notes and say, hey, leave it in my in my backyard, leave it with my neighbor. Um, you you get alerts of when it's coming. You get reminders, and this technology is only going to get more and more advanced using that sort of Uber type um, capabilities, where you'll actually be able to track your package coming. You'll get an alert when it's five minutes away. You'll be able to see the delivery driver come down the street on the map, and this is actually really, really powerful. You know, we already have this in Canada with some of the online grocery delivery, but this you know, guaranteed is going to come just to sort of generic um, uh, delivery capabilities, giving the consumer the choice to decide when and how they get their products. And then um, another sort of few sort of interesting things happening around delivery, um, over left to right. So. It is a really cool startup in San Francisco that won't just deliver, they'll pick up. This is huge for returns. One of the big problems in e-commerce is just the, the pain of doing an online return. You've got to go to the post office, pack it up. These guys will come to your door and just take it away from you and they'll pack it up for you and send it back. So that's a really interesting innovation. I think we'll see automation, we hear a lot about drones, but also we may start seeing these little sort of automated vehicles rolling around in the next five years. Um, and, and, and you know what it's all gonna do is drive down the cost of that last mile delivery. And then finally, this is kind of a fun one, but we shouldn't necessarily dismiss it. This is Walmart doing a trial in the US using Walmart customers to deliver package, to, to deliver e-commerce orders for other customers. So using sort of this, this social sharing economy, you may have your neighbor, the guy at the end of the street, deliver your next e-commerce purchase. All right, oh, so moving on. So, sort of third trend is this idea that content is king. Um, you know, we always talk about sort of content, uh, you know, online. And, and, you know, we've kind of known this for a long, long time, but a lot of brands haven't taken this seriously. And so when we look at sort of data that asks, um, you know, which of the following um, sort of features and capabilities on a retailer's website did you use, number one is that product information. There's that anxiety when you're buying online that am I buying the right product? Will it do what, it's, what I need it to do? Does it have all the features, the capabilities, the specs? And so in the past, it's been very sort of basic with just you know product image, a price, a description, maybe a few sort of technical specs. But a lot of the time, there's still anxiety. The consumer won't add to cart because there's some kind of critical information that they need that the website isn't answering. And they have to go research in a forum or go to a store or talk to an expert. So we're seeing a lot of investment now, especially from brands who ultimately own the, the product experience in really, really detailed product information. A couple of great examples here. This is like, um, and we see a lot of this in sort of the, the power world. So, you know, outdoor equipment, hugely complex. And so, you know, when I'm buying a backpack here, um, you know, it's asking about lumber support. I have no idea what lumber support is, but now they explain it to me with videos and images and actually explain why this is important, what that feature is, how it works. Similarly, one of our clients, Heli Hansen, you know, one of the, you know, allowing you to filter by the size. So I know exactly what size I am. Only show me things that are medium, so I'm not wasting my time looking at products that are out of stock or the products that don't come in a medium. A few other things that are happening sort of on the product content side. I see a lot of manufacturers trying to sort of differentiate the direct channel, uh, perhaps trying to avoid conflict with their physical retail and their wholesale channels, and creating um, personalized experiences. So we think of things like Birchbox, but interestingly, companies like Head, um, allowing you to create very, very personalized products online that are manufactured to your specific spec, custom paint jobs, you know, as choosing the exact handle you want, you know, the strings that you want. So you, you build this highly personalized, unique product. And that's something that the web can do very, very powerfully that allows the, the, you know, a lot of the brands to differentiate their direct channels. So we're seeing a lot more investment in this. Also in things like um, sort of uh, onshore manufacturing, using 3D printing and so forth to be able to facilitate some of this. We're also seeing a big investment in shoppable content, getting away from this um, sort of paradigm of e-commerce site being a home page and a category page and product listings and a product retail page to much more of that sort of glossy magazine type of feel. So a lot of retailers making huge investments in shoppable video, um, contextual shoppable video where you can pause the video, you can hover over any of the items, see what they are, explore them, add them to a wish list. Um, and, and so we're seeing a, a big, big investment in high quality sort of 4K type video production. And, and then also sort of editorial content with that sort of uh, hover over contextual commerce capabilities. We're also seeing, um, I think, 
you know, I talked earlier about sort of this product anxiety. What are the products that we um, that we consider online, especially sort of high consideration, expensive purchases that are over a couple hundred dollars? These are things that as consumers we spend days, weeks, months researching before we finally have the confidence to buy. We may never go to a physical store. We may never talk to an employee of the company who's selling this. We rely entirely on on um, sort of the online tools. And we've seen retailers like uh, Crutchfield and um, uh, Backcountry.com sort of try to invest in a sort of one-to-one -one relationship. And, and, but this model isn't scalable because this idea that you know actually you know having a sort of social interaction with a, a, a product expert, a gearhead, um, through sort of a, a social media type thing is great, but it, it doesn't scale. And what we're starting to see now is sort of artificial intelligence, some of these chatbots and things, really, um, you know, using technology like IBM Watson, really starting to actually change the game here, where you can actually have a sort of intelligent discussion um, with a, a, an artificial intelligence um, engine that really, really understands some very unique questions that you may have about a product. So this is, again, an area that we're going to see a lot of sort of transformation on um, in the coming years. Now, the fourth and final trend I just wanted to touch on quickly um, is one that's sort of very dear to the heart of Mobify. Um, and and, and you know, Peter talked about it earlier, but mobile apps and the mobile web are converging. Um, it's happening. I, I think it's happening more where the, the, app, the, the web now is able to facilitate a very app-like experience. Um, we're certainly you know, watching interestingly to see if apps you know, can have that instant gratification that the web can have. But I think ultimately you know, what we've learned over the, the last you know decade of the web is that the web always wins um, and uh, you know yes it will always be both apps uh, native apps and mobile web um, but it is those sort of very high loyalty type environments um, uh, you know people who are doing a lot of repeat purchases a year where the mobile apps really work um, and for everyone else for all the other retailers that have customers that only buy once or twice a year you know those customers are just not going to install an app they're not going to give you that real estate but they want that really slick app like experience that rapid really sort of clean user interface and, and, and no sort of lag and delay. And so, you know, in one of the technologies that Mobify are pushing very, very heavily at the moment that we're watching very, very closely at Magento is um, PWAs, Progressive Web Apps. Um, I think they're, you know, very similar story to what happened with responsive design about five years ago. Um, you know, very uh, sort of new technology, um, a little bit slow perhaps to get adoption in the marketplace, um, but potentially very, very game-changing technology. As you know, we, as, as you know, we see at Magento, you know, many of our merchants this year saw more than half of all of their transactions coming over, you know, coming over the mobile channel uh, during the holidays, and and you know, the barriers to further um, shift to, to, to mobile transactions is really um, speed of performance. Um, you know, the web is still sort of slow as you go from page to page and touch to touch. Um, and, and one of the exciting things about progressive web apps is really, you know, just how fast and slick they are. Um, so, so, you know, I'm not going to sort of preach on, on all the benefits. You know, the mobile team are far more qualified than I am to sort of uh, tell the story of, as to, you know, why they're excited about PWAs. But I think, you know, just to say, you know, from a different perspective as, a, as an e-commerce platform vendor, you know, we're very, very excited about this technology as well and I'm watching this very, very closely. So I know I, I didn't have long, just wanted to touch very, very briefly um, on, on sort of four emerging trends that, that we see and uh, uh, just thank you for, for having me this morning.